Awesome. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Steve Roberts. I'm a senior technical evangelist for .NET at AWS. My name is Norm. I'm the senior dev on the AWS .NET team. Okay, so today we're going to spend the vast majority of this session looking at a new demo application that Norm has written to illustrate modern .NET development on AWS. But first, we want to take a few moments to bring you up to speed with the latest news uh, for .NET on AWS itself. So I want to start with, um, there are two new links for you. So we have a whole new .NET developer center on the main AWS site, aws.amazon.com slash net. This is the main sort of product, uh, product collection page. So jumping off links to the documentation, the installers, et cetera, everything you need to know to get started with .NET on AWS and samples and news as it comes out. We recently also launched a new repository on GitHub. So if you've seen over the past few years, we've been increasingly open sourcing the tools for .NET. So we've gathered every, or links to all those repos now into one central repository, github.com slash aws slash .net. Um, that's where we first stop to find out all the tooling that we have and the open source. Norm, it's been a busy year on Lambda. It has been a very busy, busy, busy year for Lambda. This year, we launched two .NET Lambda runtimes. Back in January, we launched .NET Core 2.0. And then in the summer, we launched 2.1. Um, I would highly recommend anyone doing Lambda um, be on .NET Core 2.1. When we did the .NET Core 2.0, that was sort of a special thing we did, because generally Lambda only supports long-term supported versions of the runtimes. 2.0 was not a long-term support, but it had such more compelling features over the existing 1.0, we decided we would make that, uh, do, make that exception. But now Microsoft has taken 2.0 out of support, so there's not going to be much more support coming out from Lambda. So I would highly recommend everyone move to 2.1, which has a three-year life cycle coming from Microsoft. Uh, another thing we did is we wanted to have our PowerShell developers in, join the fun with Lambda. So we created a new PowerShell module that allows you to point out your PowerShell script and say, I want to run this script as a Lambda function. So that module is called AWS Lambda PS Core. It's distributed on the PowerShell gallery. I highly encourage you to go and check it out. It's really neat. And finally, we launched an update to the tools for Microsoft Visual Studio Team Services, or Azure DevOps, as they're now called. You recall, last year we released 1.0, just before reInvent. Uh, we did a point 0.1 update this year. We added some new tasks. We eased up the deployment uh, scenarios for Lambda functions uh, for those people that wanted to deploy, do a build, and then deploy through their release pipeline. But more importantly, we increased the flexibility of the credential handling. So we heard back from customers that using the service endpoints with fixed access and secret keys or assume role was a little bit restrictive in their environment. They wanted to interface to their in-house federated systems and get temporary credentials back for the build host. So we added the ability to get credentials from environment variables on the build host or task level variables. We also added the ability if your build host is running on an EC2 instance, it can get credentials and region automatically from the instance profile on the instance. So you don't even need to configure that. Just configure the tasks of what you need and go. So pretty excited with that update. OK, so that's it for news. Let's talk about modern .NET applications on AWS. So the application that we're going to demo today was built as a vehicle to demonstrate what a modern .NET app looks like for AWS. It should come as no surprise. It's written in .NET Core. It's fully serverless. It uses Lambda functions and containers. Why? Because we don't want our developers managing infrastructure. They should be focused on the application logic. That's where the value is. Let us manage the infrastructure. You manage your app. So serverless. Secondly, in previous demos that we've done at reInvent, you'll have seen us uh, demonstrate the tooling from Visual Studio or the .NET CLI for doing deployments, et cetera. We're going to be doing that again today, but Norm has also written a full CI CD pipeline behind the scenes that we're also going to demonstrate in the demos that show you how you can deploy um, your applications using CI CD with the AWS Code Services. So I'll be taking that into account. So with that, I'd like to introduce our simple, or Norm's simple elastic mosaic processing application. And we're going to spend the rest of this session looking at what it does, how it was built, the services that Norm chose to use, and what problems did he solve along the way. And we're going to learn modern application architecture with serverless and containers. Some new Lambda debugging techniques that we're excited to share with you. Um, some new AWS extension libraries for our .NET SDK. Uh, these are on GitHub. They're not currently on NuGet. They will be soon. We're just doing the final fit and finish um, and feedback, et cetera, um, to get those ready. And as I just mentioned, a CI CD with the AWS code services. So with that norm, let's talk about mosaics. All right. So if you've seen any of Steve and I's previous talks at reInvent, we generally seem to do a lot of things around um, pictures. Um, I am a father of two kids. And as the dad's job, my job is to dig all of the pictures. And I have hundreds of thousands of family pictures. 
So this year, we thought we'd go cloud scale with our pictures. So we make uh, mosaics out of them. And what a mosaic is, is you take an original image, um, and then you're going to recreate that image made up of hundreds and thousands of pictures. So you can see that first image on the left is the source image, and it gets created into that middle image, which might look a little grainy, because if you zoom in, you can see all the individual images that it is actually made up of. So our architecture of application is really going to be broken down into three main subsystems. The first is how uh, we, in we add galleries to our system. This is our mosaic tile, ga tile gallery ingestion system. And then with that, we have our mosaic rendering subsystem, which takes our gallery and a source image and will actually render our mosaic. And then so our users can actually use these subsystems. We're going to have a UI on top of that that will allow users to log on um, and create their mosaics or galleries. OK, and so to reiterate, all of this is fully serverless. We're not managing any infrastructure here as developers. So before we can start generating mosaics, we need a tile gallery. We need those tiles that we're going to build the final image from. We're calling that the Tile Gallery Ingestion Service. And what this does, it takes a zip file from a user containing multiple images. Now, when we were putting this demo together, we were considering what to use as a source of images. I mean, Norm's family album, it's kind of getting to be cloud scale, but you know, it's his family images. So we thought, well, what about the internet as a source? And then we thought, that's probably not a great idea in a public demo. <laughs> so we decided to fall back to a zip file of Norm's family images. We too will have the internet when we're not in front of people. Um, so the process of ingestion actually analyzes each image that's inside that zip file to create the tile information, shrinks it down to be used as a, used as a tile, and then puts information about it into a name gallery that we can then use in the second system. So Norm, let's walk through how the tile ingestion works. OK. So again, we're going to take a zip file in, and we're going to use ADBIS batch to process that zip file. Um, this is going to, and with, with that, we add a job to a job queue. And Batch is going to take images from our ECR and spin up containers to actually run those jobs. And what that job is actually doing is it's downloading the zip file, and it's going to upload those images to S3. Now, this part of the process, we couldn't really figure out how you would parallelize reading from a zip file. Um, so we kind of kept this logic very simple, and this is all this does. But all the other work it has to do, um, we wanted to parallelize. So for that, we use Lambda. So as those images upload to S3, uh, there's an event hookup there, which triggers our Lambda processing image function. And remembered, we said we thought we might grab images from the internet and we wanted to be safe. We're going to use image recognition to make sure it's a good, clean image for us. And then we got to go compute some color information for the actual image and store a thumbnail for that. So we're going to store things in DynamoDB and S3 for that. So that lower two boxes are what we consider to be a tile gallery. The metadata about the color and this, the resized individual images. So at reInvent, this is the first time that we've used Batch as right. part of a .NET demo. Right. So what led you to using Batch? Well, one of the most common questions I get from developers is, um, do I go Lambda or do I use containers? Um, and frustratingly, the answer usually is depends, or both, in, in the case we're doing here. Um, in our case, we're going to, we want to use containers because our application, that zip file can be rather large. And I've taken a lot of pictures. It was an 8 gig zip file when I first uploaded this in here. He has taken a lot of images. I do. And you know, doing that in a Lambda, you don't have 8 gigs of, of storage space to put that on there. Um, and it could take a long time. So here, we wanted something with a container. I didn't necessarily care if it was run um, immediately. I was fine with running asynchronously which Batch provides that we have a job queue. We just add it to a queue, and it will run it when there's available compute capacity for us. And it also gave us a lot of knobs for cost saving. Um, like Lambda, when there's no charge for when there's no functions going on, in Batch, we can set the minimum compute power for our Batch um, compute environment to zero. So if there's no jobs running, we're not going to pay for Batch. Only when there's jobs running will we actually have anything to pay for them. Another way we can save costs by using batch is, again, we might not necessarily care when these things got done. If we want to be extra you know, saving of money, we might want to use EC2 spot instances and run these jobs uh, maybe late at night when the spot prices go down. But we're not going to manage those spot instances. We're just going to tell batch, use those um, to provide your compute power. OK, so I think we should go take a look at the ingestion process. OK. 
get this demo rolling. All right. Let's see. All right, right button. OK, so here we are in Visual Studio. On the left over here is my AWS Explorer. These are the DynaDB tables that I'm working with. Um, and the solution explorer is there's sort of three folders for each of the three subsystems in my application. Now, if I was a larger team, more than one, I would probably have separate repositories and all these separate solutions. But for today, making this demo, I just did everything in one repository, one solution. So here we are on the gallery generator. So this is the two projects that we have that's going to take care of the tile ingestions. The first one is my console application that does the zip download and upload to S3. And so this is just your standard done application that's got a console main. And all we're going to go do is download the zip archive. I'm going to download it to my temp storage on my, in my container. And once I've downloaded it, I'm going to open up that zip archive. Um, and I think down below here, I'm going to go upload the images to S3. Something to note here is I'm uploading it into my bucket with the, calorie, um, with the key prefix of galleries raw. Because when I set up my event listener for the Lambda functions, I'm going to only have it be triggered if the key has this start to it. And so this is how we can just get our Lambda function call for just certain uploads to there. And we're doing that because we're sharing the same bucket for the other data, right? Right. Yeah. The thumbnails and everything will be in the same bucket. Uh, I have this other config object. This is how I am getting the, user, the information of how to run this object. This object um, comes down from my git config method here that I call at the beginning, which is going to look either at the user arguments or environment variables to find what's the user ID this is for, what, where's the URL to the zip file, all that you know, startup information. And when I run batch, I'm just going to set these environment variables. I'm going to say, run this container with this console and set these environment variables. Now to the, but in the web application that runs, that's just going to send those in. Right. Okay. So we can um, deploy this to um, AWS by right-clicking on this and say, pu publish the container to AWS. And for batch, all we're going to really do today is we just want to push this Docker image to ECR, the Elastic Container Registry Service. Um, batch is going to be pointing to this container registry when it wants to run a job, which we'll show later. So I'm just going to go push publish. So you can see how easy it is to get started just kicking the tires from it inside Visual Studio using the wizards. But obviously, in your main systems, you're not going to be using Visual Studio and the wizards uh, in your CI CD. So we'll show you how we did this uh, in the CI CD system later in the demo. Right. And so what this does is really it's going to do the Docker build, it's going to log on to ECR, and it's going to push the image, which I have pushed this image a few times in practice talks today. So that's why the push was rather fast, because it's only pushing the changes since the last time you ran this. So that took care of our, that first part. Now the second part is we have to deploy our Lambda function. So our Lambda function here, let's take a look at that. And so for this guy, we are listening for S3 events. So we take in that S3 event object, and we're going to go loop through that, those records and process each one of those. And so our flow is, first we're going to go in, we're going to go see, is the image safe? Because again, we were afraid we we're going to get scary things from the internet. <laughs> um, and so we use image recognition to go look to see if there's any moderation labels. If there's any moderation labels that come out, we're playing it's completely safe, and we're just skipping out of here. All right. Once we've determined that this is an image that we're willing to accept into our gallery, we're going to go download that image. Then I have some of my own logic to go basically figure out what's the average color of that image, so we'll know how to, where we can put that in later when we create a mosaics. We're going to go and create a thumbnail of our image and upload that to S3, and then save to DynaDB the actual um, the metadata for this. So, we'll, so when we want to create images, we just go to DynaDB to figure out what's the best image to fit for that one. All right. I think we can deploy that now, right? Do it. So to deploy it, we can just right click here, publish to AWS. This is using a CloudFormation-based one. I've done this before, so everything has been kind of already set for me. Yeah, so both projects have the defaults file set, so they already contain the various settings that the wizard's automatically picking up, and the CI CD will pick up when it runs. We don't need to give parameters here. OK. And so when we do this deployment, basically it's doing a build of the project. It's uploading the project to S3, updating the CloudFormation template to say, um, this is where the bits are for your serverless function. Um, go deploy this out. Um, 
and CloudFormation will go create the stack for us, which will create all of our resources, our IAM roles, our Lambda functions, all that we could possibly need and more. <laughs> so we have the container image deployed. We have the Lambda function just coming up. Should be a few more seconds. There we go. Right. So the third and final step then is to wire up that event handler. Right. So let me go cab. This is that key prefix that we talked about. So when we have our Lambda function, we want it to only fire for objects with that key prefix. So here's the function we just deployed. And we're going to say the event source is S3. And this is the bucket I'm using in my local development. And I set the key prefix to that one. And so now, when we upload images to that folder, it'll kick off our Lambda function. I think we could probably run the container, the batch process now. Let's do it. So let's go to the console. And here's the batch console. I'm just going to start the job right now. Um, this is the live demo. What could go wrong? Set our job definition. Set our job queue. And I'll talk about what those are in a minute while this is running. This is where we can say how much CPU we think we need for this and then the environment variables. And I've already preset most of them. I have a couple I'm going to set from my handy dandy cheat so sheet. So those are what are mapping to that config object that you're going to yep. achieve in the job. So when we have that code looking for environment variables, it's going to pull these out. And you will see, oh, I think we didn't copy that. Back to copy paste 101. What did you just say about what could possibly go wrong? Nothing can go wrong. This is going to rock. <laughs> All right. So now we've submitted our job, passing those environment variables. And when we do the UI, the UI will take care of setting those environment variables. We won't copy paste from the notepad when we're in production, I promise. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at Batch while that's running. So here we have on our dashboard, you can see here we have, our we have one queue set up for currently, and we have one compute environment. And I mentioned we can save costs by not having anything running and setting minimum to four. But because we're doing a live demo and we didn't want everyone to wait while that was being allocated, we set a minimum before. So in fact, that is probably already running as we speak. See, it's already running because we already had some compute capacity set aside for it. Um, again, like in normal development, I probably would just always set that at zero um, and then let it be allocated as I'm deploying batches out there. So a job definition is made up of basically saying, this is the IAM role that I want to use. This is what's going to provide credentials to my code. So my code needs access to S3 and down to B. When I set up my job definition, I gave it an IAM role. That gave it that access. And then I specified the container image from ECR that I want to run. So when this job, when a job with this, tied to the job definition runs, it's going to pull that image from ECR. Now, in our case today, we just, we, I didn't put a tag on the end of this which means it's always just using the latest Docker image, which is why we can, all we had to do was just do a push to ECR and everything just picked up. So this is a demo. We're effectively doing a deploy to prod. But not straight to Notepad. So it's, ah. yeah. Um, it, you probably, what you do is you would have, I would deploy it with a tag of beta, do my sanity checks, make sure it's worked in my, my beta environment, and then I would flip the tag on there to prove prod and then start using it there. That's how I do it in a real, um, environment. But from a demo point of view, it made it quick to get that up and running. And then let's take a look at the queue. So we have one queue right now, um, which has one compute environment on there. We could have multiple queue, queues in our app account. One of the things we thought is if we made this, we had some users that were paid users and some users that were community users, maybe the paid users would get a higher priority queue, um, and the community users would get the, the normal queue, we'll call. Um, and the normal queue can maybe be used of EC2 spot instances. In the paid user, we could use from on-demand compute instances. We have a lot of flexibility on how we want to set that up, depending on our particular needs. Even though we're not managing infrastructure? We're not. All we're saying is, if we looked at the compute environment, is that this is a, I think it says in there, it says it is a managed compute environment. You can manage it yourself. I personally would rather someone else manage it for me. So. All right, so let's see. Is our job done? Did we succeed? Did we have practiced this a few times? All right, 201. So yep, that's the one. we succeeded. Now, one of the things uh, I didn't show in the Lambda code, though, um, if we go back over here to the constructor, you can see 
I actually registered X-Ray for all of the AWS service clans. So by adding this line of code with the, AD, with the extra SDK, all my service clients will send trace information to X-Ray so I can kind of see what's going on with my Lambda function. Can we go check, it, check that out? Let's do it. So we'll go to the X-Ray console. Come on, there we go. And this will go compute our map based off all those tracing informations we sent up there. And there's our graph. I was hoping for a sea of green. But we wanted to make it interesting. <laughs> so we hear of our lambda function, which is calling S3, and we're having some sort of problem when we're calling Im image recognition. And we could drill down that in X-ray. We could say, look, let's look at those traces. Uh, take a look at one of those, and we can see we've got some sort of problem calling um, detect moderation labels. So at this point, previously, we would have gone off and presumably looked at the CloudWatch logs of the function yeah. to try and figure this out. Which we could still do. Which we could still do. But we got something more we could do. One of the, a release we did la last week with the AWS Toolkit and a new Lambda test tool is you can actually, oh wait, before I do that, I jumped ahead. With the serverless template, I actually created an extra queue with my serverless template. And that queue is assigned to my Lambda function as the dead letter queue. Now, if you've never used a dead letter queue, what it does is when you have a Lambda function that's being called asynchronously, like with an S3 event, Lambda's going to try a few times. I think it's three times it tries with an exponential backoff. If your Lambda function keeps failing with that event, it'll add that message to the queue. And then we can go look at that queue to go and debug our Lambda function. So each message in that queue is the full event that that Lambda yes, function received. It's received. the same event that Lambda. Everything they got. Right. Okay. So now we have our Lambda function as our startup project. And with the latest Visual Studio, we can just push F5. Latest Visual Studio Toolkit. Latest Visual Studio Toolkit. <laughs> and this launches our new Lambda test tool. And here we can do, we can add our sample events in here and execute it. Or we can also have it go and monitor our dart letter queue. And we can say, start monitoring it. I only have one queue. And it's going to go pull that, that, that queue that we had that had those failing messages in production and say, oh, there's something here. Let's grab it and run it locally with inside this test tool. And Visual Studio is debugging this tool. So this means that we can actually then start stepping through our actual Lambda code. So this is great for finding faults in your application logic. In right. Your, right. This is your application so this, logic test. Effectively a simulation. All right. And so if I just push F5, I bet we will get the exception here. Yeah. We have an F image, uh, invalid image format going to image recognition. What did we try to send? Our key says that for some reason I dumped the .NET SDK in the zip file for yeah, some reason. A C-sharp file is not going to pass moderation. So. Um, so, OK, as a developer now, I would make a fix here somewhere. Either I would filter out the non-image files in the, in the batch process, or potentially in the Lambda function, or even both for ultimate. I would do uh, both, safety, right? Say. And then do a redeploy. But I don't want to use Visual Studio to do my redeploy. Right. right? So uh, what I would do is I would then just check that in, and then we'd use our code pipeline to go and process this out. So this is the pipeline that I set up. And again, I was a team of one. I just had one repository. You would probably have everything in different repositories. But here, I have one code commit repository that's doing, this is what I'm doing for the tile ingestion. First, I'm doing a code build to build their Docker image and then push that to ECR. And then for the Lambda function, I'm going to run a code build that's going to build our Lambda function um, and then pass that CloudFormation template um, down to our CloudFormation service to deploy that out. If we look back at our build spec files, so here is the build spec file for the Docker image. What I'm doing is I'm installing our .NET Global tools because all of the Lambda tooling and container tooling that we have inside Visual Studio is also always available in our global tools. So here's the ECS one. We install that, and we call ECS push image, and it will do the exact same thing we did to the wizard in Visual Studio. It'll do the Docker build, log on to ECR, and push that out. So for Docker, that's all we had to do. For Lambda, look at that build spec. Same thing. We're going to install the Lambda tools this time. And then we're going to call the Lambda package CI command off that. What that does is it's going to go and look at this serverless template 
and go look for all the Lambda functions in there and build the, the associated .NET Core project with it, upload that project to S3, and then update that template um, with the location to S3, and then write that new template to this guy over here, the updated template. So that's a copy of the template. That is right? a copy. And then that is the actual build artifact coming out of this code build, is that template. And this is what we're going to pass to CloudFormation. In fact, the way I create my pipelines, I did that through CloudFormation. In fact, this is the only bit of infrastructure that you managed. Right. <laughs> and so this is my pipeline here. And there's the code commit. Here's the build stages. I'm just going to skip past those. So I want to show you the CloudFormation part. So here's the CloudFormation part that is taking in our input from the last step, and it's taking the updated template to go and create that change set for us. Once we have the change set, we're going to go execute that chain set, which will then get our Lambda function deployed, our IAM role created, um, our queues. All that stuff will be created for us by CloudFormation. Yeah. That's nice it. Simple. OK. All right. Let's head back to the slides then. So we saw there the first of the serverless subsystems, the tile ingestion for, for the galleries. Um, and using the new feature on dead letter queues that uh, we've with the mock Lambda test tool to help us diagnose failures. We don't need to go necessarily to the CloudWatch logs now to figure out what went wrong. We can debug it locally um, and see what happened. We also have how to use the .NET Core global tools in our CI CD pipelines. We get the same behavior that we see in Visual Studio with the wizards, which, as I said, is great for kicking the tires, getting started. But as you move to a more mature CI CD, uh, you know, you can need those extra tools, how easy they are to use, and how to use batch of the containers um, and .NET. So we have the tile gallery ingestion subsystem ready to use. Now we need to think about mosaic rendering. All right. So in this subsystem, uh, what we want this to do is to take an image file from the user. Imagine that they're logged into their website, uploading something, uh, and the name of a tile gallery they've created, and then analyze the image against the tile data in the gallery to pick out the right tiles to use, and then rebuild the image as a mosaic. So pretty simple steps. So let's walk through how this uh, is done. And I can see that you chose to use step functions. I did. And in this case, this is a good use of using Lambda. We have a lot of discrete subsections we can use here and do in Lambda. And step functions allows us to have the workflow. So we're going to start our workflow through some mechanism. we we'll trigger it through our UI or something. And then the first thing we need to do is we have to create the color map from that source image. And what that means is we're going to take that source image and we're going to basically break it down into small little squares of 10 by 10 pixels and figure out what its average color is. Once we know that, we're going to go our next step and we're going to go find out what is the best image that maps um, from our gallery that maps that square? I see you're doing that with an F sharp lambda. That is true. So again, with step functions, we can do each one of these steps as completely independent units, separate dependencies, separate languages. We can do it in C sharp, .NET Core, PowerShell, PowerShell. or you could go do a non.NET language if you were that type of person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went there. You went there. Um, OK. So, now, one again, if you use Lambda, the, one of the biggest factors in the cost of Lambda is how much memory you allocate for your Lambda functions. Um, and we could get a variety of images coming into our system, small images, large images, and that sort of determines how much memory we want for our Lambda functions. So another way to control our costs is, is we're going to look to see how big the image is and then use which renderer, which means how much memory we want for it, for that Lambda function. Once we render it, we're just going to go send that to S3, and then we're going to send off to DynamoDB saying, you're done. We've got an image ready. OK. Should we go see it? Let's do it. All right, back to Visual Studio. So here in this section, my step functions, you can see I have a, several Lambda function projects here. I have my, here's my create color map, my determine best fit function image, which that's one in F sharp. Here's our renderer, and here's our notification. We have all these separate functions. We're not going to go through all their code, but I do want to take a look at one of them just so you can see the pattern that we used. So here's creating the color map. And with that, we're going to take in a state object. This is the class that I just wrote. It's my own C sharp object that contains all of the state for the current workflow. And it's what my, my UI is eventually going to go provide to us the, the initial C data for it. So we can have this data, and as we, we can make changes to it, and then we're going to return that back as the return step. And so this is what gets transferred through all of our different Lambda functions. Back and forth, this object is going to be serialized and deserialized to JSON with step functions in Lambda. 
So our upstream lambda functions are setting data that the downstream lambdas are going right. to pick up and work off, right? So for example, in this guy, this is what gets that first image, and it's going to go and go determine how many pixels are in this image. Because later, when we, use the, we have that choice, we're going to use this property to figure out which lambda function we want to use. So this gets added to our state. Now, the rest is just my logic I have for creating the step function, so I'm not going to go through that part here. Let's take a look at the fact that we actually have four projects that we want to deploy, but we want to deploy this as one serverless application. And this is a change, again, we did to the Visual Studio we launched last week. Visual Studio Toolkit. Visual Studio Toolkit. But we'll get that down. <laughs> In our serverless template file, this is the CloudFormation template, where we define our Lambda function. Before then, we would always just build the current project and assume that's where your, project, your code was for your Lambda function. With the new version, you can actually specify a relative path to a project. So each of these Lambda functions are pointing to different projects. So when I deploy this CloudFormation template with our tooling, it's going to go build each of these projects up independently and then deploy this as one CloudFormation template. And some of these, like our renderer, we're referencing the same project multiple times, just with different memory settings. The, first, the small is using one gig, and the two is using two gigs, because these images can be large. So the build is only going to build it once, though, right? It will build it once and then refer it multiple times in our template. So if I was one of those, uh, what do you call them, other people? Other people. That are not using .NET, I don't and know I have a, a, a Lambda function written in a different language that's been built by an earlier step, can I use it with this? Yeah, so this tooling will build down at projects, but if you had, like, some of your devs had already given you a zip file of a Node.js that it was doing something specific, you could reference that zip file here. If you leave the bucket field empty, it's assuming that you're still referencing a zip file locally and will upload that as part of the deployment. If you have it already deployed to AWS, you could just specify where it is in S3 with the bucket, and we'll just leave it alone. So that's how you conclude things that are not part of the .NET Core world. OK. All right. So one thing that we have not updated Visual Studio for, which I hope to do soon, um, is I actually added my template not in a project. Because if you remember, when we deploy a project, we right-click on a project to deployment. But since my CloudFormation template is not part of a project, I don't currently have that option in the AWS Toolkit. Toolkit. See, I got it right that time. Got it right. So for me to do it this way, I'm going to actually, I should say, if you do put this in a project but then reference other projects still relatively, it will work by the right click. But because I don't have it in a project, I'm going to do this from the command line. And here, I can just say .NET Lambda Deploy Serverless. And again, I have practiced, I have to spell. You'd think I would know how to spell serverless. Again, because we've got that defaults file set up. Uh, we don't need to give it any parameters here. It's going to read those and just use them. Let's look at that defaults file. So here's our defaults file that we'd already done in previous ones, which set up our buckets or regions. Um, one of the curious things that some of you might have not known about is in our .NET Core tooling, we have a thing called template substitutions. The reason we have that is because I'm not a fan of writing JSON documents with inside JSON documents. Mm -hmm. So if you've written a state machine, that is a JSON document, which would normally be written in your CloudFormation template inside this field here. So you'd have to escape all the quotes and right. everything else. So what that template substitution is doing is it's saying, for this JSON path, replace what its contents is with what's in this file. So I can define my whole state machine in a separate file. When we run our deployment tooling, it will do all the combining of that. If we look at our state machine, we can see here we start at our color map, which goes down to determining best images, which then goes into choosing a renderer, which looks at that pixel count, that property saw set in that first Lambda function, which is how we're going to choose which one of our Lambda functions we want to actually do. And then we fall down into the notification step, and we're done. All right, I suspect we are all deployed. Uh -huh. Should we go check it out? Go play with it. So let's go to the step function console. Here's our state machine. And let's just do an execution. Handy dandy cheat sheet. Okay, so that JSON is going to get deserialized into the state object that you defined. Right. Um, pass through. So, yeah, that state object will be converted into this. 
It's now going to run our state machine, which is now currently building that color map for us. Once we have our color map, we're going to go find out what is the right image from our gallery that best well, fits. We would, but you've we got would, a problem. But we broke it. Okay. What do we do? So let's take a look at what we did wrong. So we can click here. We can see we have some sort of index out of range exception. Something's gone poorly. But we have a new tool to test this, right? Yeah. So in here, we have this is the actual event, the state of our state object when it called this Lambda function. So we can take this and use our Lambda tester to go and replay this locally. Now, we just saw how we did this in Visual Studio Code, or Visual Studio. <laughs> Let's take a look at how we can do it in Visual Studio Code. So here's Visual Studio Code. And we have updated my launch.json file. Now, in Visual Studio, if you have the latest one, it will just automatically set it up as you open up a, dot, a Lambda project. With Visual Studio Code right now, you would have to um, manually set up the, the launch path, which there are instructions for. I'll show you to do. The test tool is a .NET Core global tool. So that's how you get it. And you just update your IDE of choice to point to that. And you make sure your current working directory is where your project is because this is where this tool is going to know how to find your code and, and load it up. So given that this, this mock Lambda test is a .NET global tool, and this is just a launch JSON entry, mm -hmm. this means I can debug my local Lam my application logic, my Lambda function, on not just Windows now, but Mac and Linux. Yes. I've got VS Code. And in any IDE. I've done it in Writer. I've done it in Visual Studio for Mac. And cool. So it works for all. All right. So here is we're going to use the regular page. I could select one of my sample ones. I could save requests. But we're going to go use the input we got from the step function console and sort of figure out what went wrong. So let's push execute. And I already had a breakpoint set up. And now we're in our F sharp lambda function, which still follows that same pattern where we take our state object and it becomes the return here. So we're going here. I'm going to push F5 because I have another breakpoint that I think will give us some better clues. What's going on? So here we are. We've loaded our tiles. Um, and it looks like we have no tiles we actually loaded. So I'm going to guess we indexed wrong out of zero tiles. Uh, having spent nearly a lifetime typoing, uh, you have not typos worked in your with docs, me for a lifetime. I'm betting you got the name of the gallery wrong. Let's see. So yes, indeed, it should have been Norm J Family Picks with a plural. Um, I have dumb fingered it in for the millionth time. So let's just go redo this. So let's. Again, take our initial input. I'll close that down. Set up another execution. And let's actually fix the typo. And this time, we'll start the execution. So this time, hopefully, all right, we've got our color map. It is now hard working on creating our best images. And it'll go render and notify that. And I'm pretty confident it's going to work. So why don't okay. we go look at how we did this in CICD? Yep. what goes wrong in live demos, right? So next step here, this is very similar in the last section to how we deployed the Lambda function for the S3 event. We use code build to build the Docker image and create that new updated CloudFormation template um, and then use CloudFormation. And that build spec file is, again, very similar. So in this case, here's the build spec file. Install the Lambda tools and run the Lambda package CI command. And that's all there is to it pass in that template and have the updated template. So and my output template, again, has the, the locations updated because it's built the, lo the relative path right. of the project. And for each of those projects, this each is going to build all four of those projects and have all of them set up correctly in that template. Yeah. And the state machine injected. Right. All right. all right. I suspect we're still rendering. Still rendering, but I think hey, cool. we'll just move on while that's Yeah, going. we'll see that one in a little while. Let's move on to the slides. OK, so that was serverless subsystem number two, the uh, mosaic renderer. And we, show, we saw how to use step functions, in this case, using a mix of different languages, C Sharp and F Sharp, um, to orchestrate a workflow. Um, we saw, use, again, using the .NET Mock Lambda test tool um, to debug request input. So multiple ways you can get that request input into that tool. You can use a sample request um, that's been pre-built. You can use the actual request that your Lambda function received, uh, or, as we showed in the demo one, using the dead letter queue, the data from that. And, the new support for deploying multiple projects using relative paths uh, in your serverless template. So I think we're about ready for the final part, 
the web front end. So this should come as no surprise that what we're going to want to do here is have users be able to upload images for new tile galleries that we saw in demo one by doing it by hand and uploading an image to create a mosaic. However, we only want it to be done for authenticated users. I don't want anybody coming along and uploading images into my site and to create mosaics. So, Norm, how did you do this? I well, see that you, uh, you started with happy users, which yep. is the Amazon way. We got our happy users. And in this case, we're going to use Fargate to do this. So because we, we want Fargate to manage all of our compute power, and we want to use containers. And our containers are going to come from ECR. And to handle the authentication, we're going to use Amazon Cognito. We're going to use Amazon Cognito's user pools to authenticate all of the users coming to our system. And so this is the system that's going to interact with all of our other subsystems. So it's going to go use, initiate our job, or submit our jobs to batch to create our new tile galleries. So tile input here is the first subsystem that we saw demoed. We'll expand all this out later on, but that's the first subsystem. And then if you want to create a new mosaic, we're going to upload that to S3 and then work with our rendering mosaic back in our step functions to go actually render that mosaic. OK, should we go see it? Yeah. All right, so here we are. This is my beautiful UI skills that I have veered a lot from the ASP.NET Core templates, as you can see. Everyone can get to the welcome page, but once I want to get to my mosaics, this is where we're going to get challenged to log on, because this is using ASP.NET Core's built-in authentication system, but we have Cognito that we're using as the um, authorizer. I'm going to log on with hopefully the right password. And here we are. So, so that we, mosaic there is the one we just rendered, right? Yep, this is the one we rendered. And why don't we go create one? And these mosaics are pretty large, so they take a while to download. So here is Steve. He's hanging out with the koala bears. We'll use that one. You will be made up of my family, which is weird. But okay. I, I can live with it. But so here we are. We create mosaics. I could go to tile galleries and create a new gallery there if I had another zip file. Um, but why don't we take a look at how this is uh, created yep. while we're creating you as a koala. So here's our project here. And the first thing I'm going to take a look at is my Mosaic Manager. This is just my code that I have that's going to interface with those subsystems. Now, this class is added to ASP.NET Core's dependency injection system. So all the constructors are going to, or the parameters from the constructor, are coming from the DI. That includes our application options settings and all of our service clients that we use. I'm also using the DynamoDB context object. This is part of our high-level library we have for DynamoDB, where you can use type C sharp classes or .NET um, classes and just have those be serialized to DynamoDB. So our code to create mosaic is basically we're going to grab the image that the user gave to us from the UI, and we're going to upload that to S3. And then we're going to go and create our mosaic object. This is the object that gets stored into DynamoDB. This is all that metadata there. And then this guy is the input data that we send into our step functions. And this is going to get serialized into that JSON object that you saw us paste in in the console. We'll initiate our step functions. Um, and then once we do that, we're going to save to DynamoDB that we have initiated this process. So that's the whole step of kicking off to rendering. Now, for batch, here we, we take in our parameters, user, user ID, gallery, and URL. We submit our job, passing in the queue that we want to pass it to, which job definition we want to use. And this is where we set all those environment variables that you saw me use in the console. So everything we can do programmatically here or there. So I see you're using a bunch of settings from app options there. How are those getting set? So when I was working in, you know, locally in myself, I was just putting things in my app development file, setting all those settings. But that's not how I really want to do things in production. I don't want these things buried in my container image. I want them to be able to be changed externally. So what we thought we should do is we should use Parameter Store um, from System Manager to be able to get configurations into our application. In fact, if we look at my CloudFormation template I used to build uh, all of my resources, like here, I created my job queue and my job definition out of this, and I published the arms of those all to SSM. In fact, if we go to SSM, let's just take a look here. 
System Manager. Big font throwing me off. Parameter Store. We can see here's all those settings that we put in here. Here's, in fact, this is the arm of our job definition with this key to Parameter Store. Does my code, though, have to read those settings back one by one? Uh, no, we have a new library that we're actually working on publishing very soon that makes it really simple. In fact, all you need to do when we push this out to NuGet is you will add the NuGet package, which I know will be hard to see here, but we'll have a slide that will have the name in a minute. You'll add the AWS SDK extensions configuration system manager. So you'll add that NuGet package. And then in your program file, where you're doing all the bootstrapping, you'll just add this line of saying what, what key prefixes you want from System Manager to be added to the ASP.NET Core configuration system. So that pulls down all the settings under that prefix. Correct. And we can have multiple. So I can have, I had most of my settings on a stage one. But I, for my case, I put the user pull settings under uh, a global one, because I was using the same user pull for development and prod, for good or bad. OK, so we should also point out that that library was actually a user contribution. That is true. Ken from the .NET uh, community for us, he donated that to our team that we are working on finishing and getting that finalized for us. Thank you, Ken. Now, one thing I do want to say, he added a really cool feature, though, is that the configurations are not static. I can actually say time span from, let's say, five minutes. And so every five minutes, this library is going to go and pull to see if there's new configuration information, new config data added to Parameter Store. So I can change things without doing a redeploy. Right. Cool. OK. So that's the first library that, we, we have really, that we're working on releasing. It is out on GitHub. Um, another one, if you have worked with ASP.NET Core in production, you might have run into struggle with how to deal with the, the anti-forgery token in an ASP.NET Core application. What this is is if you have like web forms, forms in your application, um, what ASP.NET Core is doing is it's putting an anti-forgery token behind that. And then when you post the form, it makes sure that the form hasn't been tampered with. And anti-forgery is based off of ASP.NET Core's data protection library, which builds a crypto information off of some keys. Now, by default, when you're working in development, it creates those keys just in memory, which works great for development. But once you're in prod, you have multiple, in our case, multiple Fargate containers. And we need to make sure all those are using the same exact key, because we don't know which server that container or that form is going to post back to. So again, we thought we could use Parameter Store to centralize that sharing of the key. So the other library we're releasing here is Amazon ASP.NET Core Data Protection SSM. Again, we'll have the link to this repo in a slide later on. And in my startup class, down here it is, where we say add data protection, we're going to say persist the keys to system manager and give a prefix of where we want it to be stored at. And so all of our containers that get launched in our cluster or Beanstalk instances, or however you're deploying this, can all get the same keys and make sure they're using in sync. And so in fact, if we go again back to um, system manager, you can see here is my data protection key that's being stored with uh, as a secure string. And you could also use your own custom KMS key with that as well. Now, the third library that we want to show, because we've talked about how we want to use Cognito um, as our, for authentication. And if you've done authentication in ASMR Core already, you might have had something like this, where you added SQL Server and Entity Framework to handle your authentication. So we want to model our new library off of this very simple way of just injecting this in your startup class, and things just work with ASP.NET Core's identity. So you're going to add a code, a line like this, that just says, add Cognito Identity Provider. And then that's going to use the user pool information that I have in my configuration and take care of use all that same ASP.NET Core um, identification. Like you saw, when I clicked on the My Pages, that is locked down. You had to be authenticated. And that's all when we have that. So again, those three libraries are out on GitHub. We will to get them out soon, and we would definitely welcome feedback. So I think those are all the libraries we wanted to show. Yeah, so again, we could deploy this from inside Visual Studio, but let's, why don't we go take a look at the CI CD for this? Right, but if you did want to do it through Visual Studio, again, if you're just trying to learn how things are, you, again, you would go right click, publish to Canary, publish Canary AWS, 
And in our case, we'd say do as a service the ECS cluster, and it would walk you through going through the Fargate deployment. But let's take a look at CI CD. Shut this down. And so here's the final stage, our front end. Again, we're using code build to build that Docker image and publish it to ECR. In my case, I added a CloudFormation step there just to make sure the service in our ECS cluster was created when I was doing the, my development. It couldn't really create the service until that initial Docker image existed. So after we did that initial Docker image, this doesn't really do anything. And then we have the front end deployment as well. So this is when we actually go tell ECS, let's use that new Docker image. So if we look at the build spec file here, Again, I'm using my Amazon ECS tools. This is our .NET Core global tool. And I'm going to go tell it to go push that image to ECS, which does the Docker build and does the log on to ECR and pushes that out. Now, in this case, we need to communicate further down our pipeline the changes that we want to do. So in this case, we need to write a JSON file that says, for this container definition, update it to this new image URI that we have. Now, what I mean by container definition is, and let's just go to the uh, console. My, my brain's melting on that indirection. Can we go see it? So let's just look at ECS here, because there are a lot of definitions, so let's just narrow this down. So here's ECS. This is my cluster that we're using here. And so my cluster can have n number of services. This is my front end service. And when you launch a service, you launch it with an associated task definition. That task definition is saying what containers, what Docker images I want to run as part of this service. So in my case, I just have one container definition, one container I want to launch. I could have multiple in here, um, but I just have one, and that's this so name that's here. So that's what maps back to that JSON file that we're writing in the CI. Right? This name here is what maps to this guy. Okay. So if I was deploying multiple Docker images, I could do multiple pushes here and put multiple entries here, and they would be passed through. So that goes to there. And then if we again look at our pipeline setup, let's go all the way to the bottom here. So here's our ECS deployment from our pipeline. Again, we're going to use ECS provider, and we're going to say use that file. This was the output from our code build, and say for this cluster, for this service, and that's what we just saw on the console, update all the container definitions that are listed in this file. And so that's how that gets rolled out there. All right, that was a lot of tech. So, do I get my Koala reward now? Oh, let's see. How did our, how did we look here? So let's go back over to Mosaics. This is our application? Yay! There's, and so here is the mosaic of my family. This is us hiking out in the Pacific Northwest. And let's see, what is my daughter's hair made out of? That can't be the Pacific Northwest. It's not raining. It doesn't always rain. <laughs> So here it is. This is a lot of pictures of my family hiking in the Pacific Northwest. I think there's some birthday parties. Sometimes when I get to sneak out and see a concert, those are those there. Let's see what Steve looks like. Here is Steve, made up of a lot of images. <laughs> and the koala here is made up, you can see, of all those pictures of my family. So we are all made up of a koala bear. So there we go. All right. All right. I think that's Let's head it. on back. So what did we see there, then? So the new upcoming libraries for handling identity, data protection, and configuration. As we said, they are on GitHub. I'll give you the link shortly. Um, we expect them to be on NuGet real soon now, but no ETA at the moment. Uh, we've got that final fit and finish to do. Um, in the first and second demos, we saw us invoking batch and set functions by hand, how to do this from inside your code, and how to share configuration with Systems Manager, Parameter Store. And then the final steps of deploying containers to Fargate using Code Pipeline. So here are the links to the upcoming repositories on GitHub. We'll have these on the, I think they're already there, but in case they're not, we'll have them on there shortly to that central .NET um, repository on GitHub. Make sure they're on there for you. Yeah, I really recommend if you guys are curious about these, check these out um, and provide us feedback, because since we haven't pushed into NuGet now, this is the best time, so we can still make um, breaking changes. So let's just quickly revisit the architecture. So again, all serverless. So the first subsystem, we used AJS batch with containers and a uh, Lambda function to do the processing for our tile gallery ingestion. Second subsystem, mosaic rendering. We use step functions onto Lambda, fun onto Lambda functions. And thirdly, the web front end hosted uh, an AWS Fargate 
um, fully serverless. And we never manage an EC2 instance or anything? Not once. OK, session wrap. So we saw the .NET Mock Lambda test tool. This is also on GitHub, open source. Uh, as we mentioned, the latest toolkit for Visual Studio uh, will auto-configure when you hit F5. If you're using Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio for Mac or JetBrains Rider, the instructions are in the readme in the repo to set it up. It's really simple. Some useful links here, the .NET blog from the team and the AWS.NET Twitter handle, AWS for Net, if you want to follow us. Uh, some extra GitHub links. But we also wanted to point out, you heard in the keynote this morning, the new upcoming toolkit for Visual Studio Code. Um, the sharp-eyed amongst you might have seen on Norm's uh, demo when he was uh, using Visual Studio. There was a short AWS logo. We have a few minutes. Do you want to see it? Steve, you worked on it. You want to try it out? We can try. No, nah, actually, you can carry on. Oh, man, you're going to make me do this? <laughs> so here we are inside Visual Studio Code. And you can see we've got a, a view open here onto our Lambda functions. And you can see, actually, Norm's deployed functions from the demo. There's a, an extra one in there, hello world. So we can invoke Lambda function. So this is if you've used the Visual Studio Toolkit, where we can invoke a deployed Lambda function using sample requests or your own, this maps to that functionality. As you can see, this is still under active development. We have a bit of a way to go yet. The UI needs some fit and finish, et cetera, as well as features. But it's looking good. Um, so if you just invoke your hello and your Lambda here, and it will open up a new output stream inside the ter debug terminal, and there's my look that came back. Yes, it's our famous hello world where we two upper things. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's early days. As I say, it's under active development. But it is open source on GitHub. We welcome feedback. We welcome pull requests, contributions, et cetera. It's initially targeting serverless workflows um, that we've shown today. So we think it's pretty cool. Please check it out. OK, so head back to the slides to say thank you. Uh,